This week, the UN Secretary General, Ban Ki-moon, made his way to the Vatican to meet with Pope Francis. This gives us a glimpse of the power of the papacy in our days, just as we would expect from Bible prophecy. This is Matt Davies joining you again for another Bible in the News. Reports stated that once he saw the Pope, Mr. Ki-moon bowed his head before greeting him. And as he was greeted by the Pope, he said, Your Holiness, it's a great honour for me to have an audience with you. And just before journalists were ushered out of the room, he was reported to have said, quote, The United Nations and the Holy See share common goals and ideals, unquote. The Vatican Press Office referred to the UN Secretary of State as, quote, His Excellency, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, end quote. It also stated in its press release that, quote, The meeting which follows in the tradition of audiences granted by popes to the various secretaries general of the United Nations who have held that position over the years seeks to express the appreciation that the Holy See has for that organization's central role in the preservation of peace in the world, in the promotion of the common good of humanity and in the defense of fundamental human rights, end quote. The press release continued though, quote, during the course of the cordial conversations, issues of mutual interest were discussed. In particular, situations of conflict and serious humanitarian emergency, especially in Syria and other places such as the Korean Peninsula and the African continent where peace and stability are threatened. The problem of human trafficking was noted, in particular that of women, refugees and migrants. The UN Secretary General, who recently began his second term in this role, outlined his project for his second five-year mandate, which focuses, among other things, on conflict prevention, international solidarity and equitable and sustainable economic development. Pope Francis also recalled the Catholic Church's contribution in support of the entirety of human dignity and in promoting a culture of encounter that helps to realise the UN's highest institutional goals, end quote. Another report stated, quote, After their private meeting, Ban introduced to the Pope members of his entourage, which included his wife, his Argentine Chief of Staff, and the UN Undersecretary for Disarmament. Pope Francis went around the room giving each guest a small boxed rosary which still carries the coat of arms of Pope Benedict. A papal aide said they are awaiting the arrival of rosaries with Pope Francis's emblem. Pope Francis spoke a few words of English during the meeting, presenting a mosaic to Ban. The Pope said, this is for you. Then he immediately switched to Italian to describe it as a view of Rome. Ban gave the Pope a blue bound tome or book containing the text of the United Nations Charter in Arabic, Chinese, English, French, Russian and Spanish. He told the Pope the Charter reflects the goals and objectives of human beings which you also promote. Now these events show us the power and influence of the papacy. No other religious leader has so much influence in the modern world. Which other religious imam or church pastor would have the UN's plans for the next five years outlined to them by the United Nations Chief Secretary? As Bible students, we should expect to see reports like these as the power of the papacy grows to fulfil its role as the influencer of nations in the coming world crisis set out in Bible prophecy. Since the papacy lost its temporal, political power back in 1870 when Garibaldi stripped it from him, it has had to make do with simply being a religious voice. This was emphasised 
by the Pope who, in the same year of 1870, declared the doctrine of papal infallibility for the first time. And as time is going on, the papacy is becoming better and better at influencing those in the world who wield the political power of the day. And this is exactly as the Bible prophesies. In Revelation chapter 19 and verse 20 we read, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. So here we read of the symbolic destruction of two symbolic entities, one called the false prophet and one called the beast. The beast is a symbol used of political European empires which, is, which existed around the Mediterranean. For example, consider Daniel chapter 7, which goes through four of these beast systems. It depicts the powers of Babylon, Medo-Persia and Greece as various beast symbols. The last beast is called the fourth beast, which relates to the Roman Empire and its influence exists up until Christ destroys it in verse 26 and 27. In Revelation, this fourth beast is described in more detail as four beast phases. But all of these phases denote the same beast system, just in different periods of existence down through time. So, for example, in Revelation chapter 12, we read of a dragon phase, the pagan Roman Empire. And then in chapter 13, we read of two other phases, a sea beast phase, which represents the Christian Roman Empire between 313 AD and 800 AD, and the earth beast phase in Revelation 13, for example, in, in verse 11, which represents the Holy Roman Empire between the period of around 800 AD to 1870 AD. And then finally, in Revelation 17, we come across the final beast phase, a whore riding the beast, which really represents the European superstate in the latter days. The beast then represents the political powers that sit on the beast territories, namely Europe. And in Revelation 19, we finally read of this power's destruction by the Lord Jesus Christ. But notice in that passage from Revelation 19 what the false prophet is mentioned as having done. We read the false prophet that wrought miracles before the beast with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast. Now this links us back to another passage in Revelation and a characteristic of a former beast phase. In Revelation 13, speaking of the symbol of the earth beast, we read in verse 14 that this earth beast deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. So what this is telling us is that within this beast phase, which, as we've outlined, existed between 800 AD and 1870 AD, an aspect of the political beast was religious in nature, and it wrought miracles before the previous beast phase, the sea beast, and it deceived. Now, these very characteristic, these very things are the things that the false prophet does in Revelation chapter 19. So what does this tell us? Well, it tells us that a change takes place amongst the political organisation of the beast power. Clearly, it's telling us that the religious aspect of the earth beast becomes separated from the political aspect. And so one becomes just the beast, and the other becomes the false prophet. It becomes so separate 
that a new symbol is required for it within Revelation, that of the false prophet. In other words, the religious aspect is no longer directly a political power, but only an influencing prophet, and a false one at that. As we've mentioned, this separation of the papacy from its political powers occurred in 1870 when Garibaldi took it from the Pope, and since that time the papacy has only had a religious voice and no political dominion. We'd like to direct our listeners to this month's Bible magazine, the general theme of which is Gentile times in the apocalypse. And on page 30 we have exposited for us the time period we are living in, known as the sixth vial, defined as being from around 1820 around the time when the decline of the Ottoman Empire commenced. And this is depicted in the Bible as the symbol of the drying up of the river Euphrates. The record of this sixth vile period is found in Revelation chapter 16, between the verses of 12 to 16. And during this time period, we read that Christ returns to the earth to establish God's kingdom in verse 15. And also within this time period, the symbol of the false prophet is first introduced to us. A very important point. Because the requirements of the prophecy then dictate that during the period from the drying up of the Euphrates around 1820 to our day today, a religious leader would appear who would be part of a system which could be traced directly back to having political power with the beast system. Clearly the only power existing today which fits this requirement is the papacy, whose current status of being only a religious leader without any political power came about in 1870 within the time period of the sixth vial. And incidentally, this is one reason why the false prophet symbol cannot be related to Islam, as some commentators suggest, because Islam appeared in the 6th century, not during the time period of the 6th vial, from 1820 onwards. And so this false prophet appears in our time, and so we should be able to look at world affairs and see the growing influence of this symbolic power. So what does all this have to do with the recent news stories of the Pope meeting with the UN Secretary General? Well, in verse 13 of Revelation 16, we read how John sees frog-like spirits come out of the mouth of the false prophet. What is this a symbol of? Well, amongst other things, the frog in scripture is associated with a false hope of human liberty. For example, see Exodus 8 verses 1 to 2. And so we relate this to the call of humanism, which seeks to liberate mankind from restrictions. We link it with the ideas reflected in the Vatican's press release of the promotion of the common good of humanity and in the defence of fundamental human rights. What is the effect of the frog-like spirits? Well, verse 14 records, For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So just before Christ returns, in verse 15, the false prophet will be influential in calling kings to muster their armies and to fight. The false prophet will speak of false liberty and of the defence of human rights. He will have the ear of the kings of the earth and of the whole world. And therefore, as we live in the sixth vile period and as we await the coming of Messiah, we can have confidence in Bible prophecy. We see a religious leader who is part of a religious system which used to wield direct political power in Europe, now separate and fulfilling the destiny which scripture has set out for him, that of an influencing false prophet. We see this as the papacy, whose popes have been croaking its doctrine of Christian humanism, 
and ecumenicism louder and louder since it became a false prophet in 1870. The most recent Pope Francis continuing the chorus. This influence surely will grow and grow until when the time is right and all the pieces of the prophetic jigsaw puzzle are in place, this false prophet will indeed influence those nations who heed its croakings to gather for the great battle of Armageddon. So let us continue to watch these signs of our times together and tune in next week for another Bible in the News, God willing. This has been Matt Davies joining you.